You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So we are in the final day of our series on the water within Scripture, just looking at some of the ways God has used, spoken through, and worked with water. Um, today we talk about besides still waters. And um, I would really like to uh, invite you to continue thinking about like the ways God has taken you through some of the waters of life, but also today dialing in and understanding um, that there's something really special when we look at waters in our life and we look at what God does to bring us to places of peace. Um, one of the things I noticed in, in preparing this was that um, we read between the lines in life, don't we? We read between the lines on certain things. I know this in ancient times, um, people wrote letters a lot more frequently. We actually have a lot of the, the letters from the Romanov, the last Romanov couple, Nicholas and Alexandra, and um, they were people dearly in love with one another. They, they were, the only problem with the Romanovs in that generation was that they wanted to be a family living on a farm out in the country alone, but they had to rule the biggest empire on earth, and it collapsed under that weight. But we know this, they wrote letters and they poured out this love and affection shamelessly. And um, they were so full of emotion, so full of nuance, so full of inside comments and twists that only the couple would have fully known. And they talked about their children and their life together and how much they loved one another. They hated time apart and wanted to just be together. There was a lot to just kind of hold on to. Now, in our day and age, it feels like communication has become convenient and it lacks emotion. If you doubt it, they actually made things called emojis so we could have emotion in our writing. You know, you get a text, how you? Oh. Or you say, what are you doing tonight? IDK, HBU? What in the world? I'm like, I know I'm old, but I'm like, that is the, like if aliens ever came and found this planet and read that, they'd be like, they were ignorant, you know? They'd be like, they talk in these weird letters that make no sounds. You know, it's all these little things where it just, it's so convenient we lose the ability to read between lines. And when we do in this emotionless kind of digital age, one thing, ha this has happened to you, I am sure of it. Who here has ever um, gone home and you notice like there's maybe nothing out for dinner? And so you text your spouse. Hey, notice there was nothing laying out, laid out for dinner? I ordered Chinese, see you at home soon. And you get a text back. Well, I can't do everything. <laughs> okay, what in the fortune cookie are you talking about? You know, like, <laughs> what is going on here? What, what, what? And you're like, no, I, I just thought we'd do Chinese. Well, we have to because somebody doesn't help. Huh, <laughs> this escalated quickly. Sorry, I didn't help. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try that, boom. And you get bubbles for like three minutes. And you're like, you look out your office window. Yep, there's black smoke pooling in the east. It's gonna be a tough night. Because <laughs> we read between the lines, don't we? Help me out, anybody ever get that text? What time will you be home? Oh, why don't you just let me be? I'm trying to finish, can't you see that? No, I'm at home. Why are you yelling with all caps, right? It's so frustrating. We read between the lines a lot and we do so really poorly. I love it, like Erica and I are terrible at it sometimes. Like, what did you mean there? LOL, ha ha ha, question mark. You know, you get those things where you don't know the emotion going on in it. So it's very hard to read between the lines, but not so with scripture. With scripture, we can see that there is this, this love of God for his people who were created in his image for his purpose because he loved them. And we can read between the lines. We can look at it with some nuance. I wanna read you a poem. It's a poem of a desperate soul. It says this, I am exhausted. I thought somebody would at least say amen. All right, um, I'm parched, so I'm thirsty. I don't know which way to go. It's dark, there's evil. I'm surrounded by enemies. I'm alone, I am empty. There is no future for me doesn't have to be all-encompassing, but I want you to do me a favor. I want this room to have a sense of community, maybe a little vulnerability from, from you. 
If one of those things is true of you on that list, just put your hand up real quick. Right? That's, in a lot of ways, that's us. We are in a grind right now. We are working it. We are trying to get it going. I am exhausted. I am parched. I don't know which way to go. And it's worse because it's dark. There is something evil, evil just lurking. I am surrounded by enemies. I am alone. I am empty and I have no future. How many of those have slid out of your lips in the past months? God, I'm exhausted. God, could you, I'm parched spiritually. Just give me something. God, tell me which way to go and I'll go. It's dark. There's evil. I'm surrounded by enemies. I'm alone. I'm empty. I have no future. There's like an anxiety in that writing that just makes you feel sick. You know what that is right there? That is the 23rd Psalm if you remove the shepherd. That is the 23rd Psalm if the shepherd isn't in it. Think about that. What does that tell us of the centrality of the shepherd? A shepherd in the ancient world is really an important image that we hold on to. When we look at scripture, the very first people that God calls to himself, the Israelites, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the time we see Jacob, the story of Joseph, what are they? They're herdsmen, they are shepherds. What was King David? He was a shepherd. 27 generations later, we have, well, we have Jesus, born of that shepherding line that understands the nuances of leading a flock, but what did they do? What did shepherds do? I think it's important that we just take a look at what they did. First of all, shepherds found safe pasture. And in America, we always think of safe, safe pastures. I do, let me say it this way, I do. Being raised in uh, Colorado and California, you would go up into the mountains and there would be sheep up there. And we always called them mountain maggots because they look like little maggots on the mountainside. And it was a horrible term, but we used it. And um, they're all dotted on the, this lush green hillside of a mountain. And there was a shepherd's trailer or tent parked next to a stream. And that's where they were. And I have this lush image in my head. In Jerusalem, Judea, the foothills of, um, of Judea, and then out into the Jordan Plain. It is arid and it is dry. A shepherd would constantly be in search of the next pasture land. They would be looking for a place to get their sheep to safely and then feed them. They were always making sure they were being taken care of. They would provide for them a safe place to drink. They would not take them to the rushing waters of a stream coming out of the mountains or a river flowing quickly. They would take them and they would move them away from the fast moving water to these pooling waters where it gets wide and deep and they would let them drink there. You know why? Because if a sheep goes and drinks from the fast moving water, remember their heads are wool, you know, not all wool, but I mean, they're, they're pretty woolly, you know? So they got these big puffy heads and they put their head into the water to get a drink. Their hair gets wet. They lose their balance and into the water they go. Sheep are magically stupid, right? <laughs> they're like, I'm gonna get a drink and put my whole face in. Next thing you know, Bert's doing the four-legged float a mile down, right? Terribly not smart. So instead of putting them in waters where the water would be rushing against their head, they put them in still waters where they can just lean down and drink safely, where if they fall in, the shepherd can pull them out. They took them to still waters. And then they provided a place of rest and safety. They would corral or pin the sheep, or they would just simply get them close together and keep watch through the night as the sheep slept. We understand that the shepherd's role is vital in the survival of the sheep. Without the shepherd, the sheep don't make it. This poem that we just read, I want you to read it. I'm going to read it to you again. And I want you to just notice the absence of that central figure. I am exhausted, it says. I am parched. I am so thirsty. I don't know which way to go. It's dark. There is evil. I'm surrounded by my enemies. I am alone. I am empty. And there is no future. Why? Because the shepherd is missing. And how many of us could say, in some measure, the shepherd is missing from our life? We are missing the presence of the shepherd. 
And what we understand is this. Without the shepherd, everything is bleak. It is darkness and it is hopeless. But life with the shepherd is still tough. Let's make no mistake that this faith is not for the faint of heart. It is tough, but it's a faith that is rooted in the identity of the shepherd, not the sheep. It's rooted in the identity of the shepherd, the one who is going to guide us to these places where we find life. We still have a tough life. But in that toughness, there is purpose. In that toughness, there is purpose. And it's not random anymore. There's a shepherd leading us. And we get to lean into the hope of that. The absence of the shepherd causes us to see the vast emptiness of life without hope, light, goodness, rest, company, and a sense of purpose. Imagine life without hope, without light, without goodness, rest, company, Now, some of you are coming off of Thanksgiving weekend where you're like, company be gone, you know? And you're like wishing them away. You're like, Daryl, didn't work, right? Yeah, I dream a genium. You do everything to get them to go. You're tired. I get it. But imagine life without company, just alone. See, what we know is the absence of the shepherd gives us an HD view at the vast emptiness and pointlessness of everything when he's not in it. When the shepherd's not present, hope, light, goodness, rest, company, friendship, relationship, and even a sense of purpose evaporate like water in the noonday sun. It just goes away. So we look at this and understand that when you put the shepherd into the poem, you get to see it come alive. You get to literally watch the poem come alive. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He leads me to green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. Even he puts me on the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is life with the shepherd in it. It doesn't say that there aren't dark valleys. It doesn't say that there aren't trying times. It doesn't say that things will be easy. It does say the shepherd will be there. And when the shepherd's there, you can trust that things are okay and his intention is for your best. His intention is for your best. I think this is where I love the story of Jesus and the disciples. This is a shepherding moment where Jesus, the great 26 times over grandson of King David, the shepherd boy who was pulled off the Bethlehem Judean hillside to become king and shepherd God's people. This Jesus has a moment in uh, Mark chapter four, verse 38 to 40. It says this. Jesus went to the stern of the boat and he was asleep on a pillow. The disciples woke him in the middle of the storm and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves and he said, quiet, be still. The lake went flat, calm and they went, oh, even the wind and waves listen. I mean, that's gotta be a disquieting mouth open moment where you're like, wow. Wow. He does care, right? And Jesus turns to him and he says this, why are you still afraid? Do you have no faith? I think that statement should resound in our lives sometimes. Why are we so afraid? Do we have no faith that the shepherd is looking out not just for our best interest, but for his? And that if he intends to be glorified through his church, that he will do the very thing he said? In Psalm 23, you guide me along right paths for your name's sake, the scripture says. Through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. What does that say? If God is guiding the path in the following line as you're gonna walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what does that mean? That God ordains our valleys. God ordains our valleys. God invites us into his storm. 
to do one thing, to remove from us a sense of self-sustaining, well, maybe righteousness, independence, pull yourself up by the bootstrap theology. That doesn't exist in Scripture. What exists in Scripture is it says that he leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I hear this scripture in um, the New King James Version in my head. It's what it was read in my church when I was little. And I always loved the thing, yay, though I walk through the valley. It just seems more scary when it's an old English text, right? It seems terrifying. But what if it's less terrifying because God set the path? Because God wants you on that road. And you may think, but it hurts. I know. But it doesn't mean you're alone. It doesn't mean you're alone. It quite actually means the opposite. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I love this text. A rod is like a billy club that shepherds would use to beat down anything that came after the sheep. A staff is for guiding. Notice the sheep's not saying, my rod and my staff, they comfort me. Unless he's a cartoon ninja sheep, wouldn't do him much good. He doesn't have opposing thumbs. He would have to hold them with his little hooves. Just wouldn't work, would it? No, he can't do anything with a rod and staff. But the shepherd can, and they comfort him. What does it say? That not only is the shepherd there, but when the wolf comes, the shepherd won't be like, hey guys, probably gonna lose two of you, but I gotta save my own skin. God bless get through it. No, the shepherd takes the club and goes marching towards the threat. Do you not know that's the God you serve? Do you not know that the shepherd who puts you in the valley of the shadow doesn't neglect walking with you in it? Listen again to the words of Jesus. When they said to him, teacher, shepherd, do you want us to just die? How many of you have said that? Like me, oh, I'm never going to make it. Why are you doing this, God? Why are you doing this? And at some point, God picks it up and says, either to us or over the storm, quiet, peace, be still. Man, how good would that sound sometimes? To have the Lord of creation just speak over our circumstances. I would uh, say to you, he does. He does. Because you're not saying, I'm alone. There's evil. There's no future. I'm exhausted. I'm parched. No, you're saying the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. We're holding on to the very one who not only authored creation, but he desires from us a relationship. He calls us to himself. He gives us the opportunity to know him. I love the idea of Jesus saying, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In my mind, that would feel shameful. But I don't think it was in Jesus' way of saying it. I think they felt tremendous peace. They were probably like, yeah, I'm not scared anymore. That was awesome. What in the world? It was great. We have to row now because there's no wind, but it's okay. I'm good with it. That was so amazing. I think it, it tremendously comforted them. So what if Jesus picked us up like a little sheep? Andrew, can I borrow your baby real quick? (laughs) Hey, Bubba, come here. You're going to go back and see her in just a minute. What if he picked us up and he just said, peace, be still. I'm still the shepherd. I'm still God. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Don't I love you? Didn't I create you in my image? Why are you so afraid? And at some point we go, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm holding on too tight to this world. Maybe I'm holding on too tight to the things that don't matter. But that's an image. Thanks, Samantha. Totally borrowed a baby. (laughs) That's an image we get to hold on to. We get to be picked up. And sometimes... The storm's in here. It's in our heart and our soul. It's in the things we value over and against God. And he picks us up and he says, quiet, 
peace, be still. Have you ever had the moment in your life where you are in a situation that is the most painful, horrible, frustrating thing in the world and you're at peace? Anybody ever have that? And you're like, why am I at peace? Because there's a shepherd who didn't leave you alone in the dark. Amen? We live in this tension, in this hope, in this confession that after the dark roads, there'll be a table set before us in the presence of our enemies. He will anoint our head with oil and surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Why? Because he's a good shepherd. His heart is for you. The, su- the stillness, the quiet and the assurance comes from him. It doesn't come from us. You can't be enough to get into heaven. You can't be enough to even be a decent person. You can though fall into the arms of the shepherd who called you his own, gave you his name. Remember, though I walk the, on the paths I walk, I do so for his name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You are Christians, Christ to this world. You think he doesn't have a vested interest? He sees his son when he sees you. He loves you. The very stillness and quiet that we get in this life, the peace in circumstances we can't understand, the peace in the middle of a storm, They come only from him being present. So if we sit in the storms of life, we have to ask, have I made room in my life to be at peace with God? Have I made room to just fall back into his arms? And as the thing said, lay in the tall grass and ask the questions. Maybe say, God, I don't understand all this, but I trust you. I trust you. We have very little stillness in our lives anymore. I notice how little quiet I have in my life. This deer season, when I went out and sat in, in, a, in a pop-up blind and another blind another time, and I'm sitting there and I'm sitting with my boys and they'll say something there. They'll say something funny. I'm like, no, <clears throat> there's deer. Stop it. It's awesome, but not now. I'm trying to be quiet. And then one opens peanut butter crackers. <laughs> you're like, you know, you just want to lose your mind. And, and I realized like how precious those moments are. We had conversations I have longed to have with them. And in the busy madness of this life, my head got a little wet in the rapid waters and I feel like I was getting pushed down. But oh, it was good to be in those still waters in that blind quietly on dark mornings with them, right? Quiet, stillness, where we're not owned by the manic schedules, but we're held by the shepherd, because the stillness and the peace of life's storms come only from him being present. There will be storms and we will have peace, though we may not like where we're at. The valley of the shadow of death remains so, but the shepherd remains Lord over it, amen? So it is the Lord, the good shepherd, that is walking us through the storm. He is walking us into the storm. Make no mistake, much of what we struggle with in this life is okay with God so that we become more like Christ. He's cutting away our attachment to this world and fixing our eyes on him and him only. And it's painful and I get it. I'm with you in that boat and I want off it most of the time. But he walks us into the storms, but he also walks us through it. He doesn't say, hey, meet you on the other side. He walks us step by step through the darkness we face. And we can know that God is light and in him is no darkness. So even in our darkness, he remains the light and the hope we we live with in that. But there's also the God who speaks. That's enough. Peace, be still. My prayer is for those of you who live in a storm right now where it's just been too much that you would hear the shepherd say, enough, peace, be still. And you would experience the peace of God right here and in the circumstances around you. But more than the circumstances around you, I would love to experience with you the peace in the center of your being. When circumstances say panic and God says, do I still love you? Am I still a good shepherd? Are your circumstances the definition of me or am I greater than your circumstances? We as a church are called to become like Christ, which means this. We are not bound to being exhausted, to being tired, to being parched, to being frustrated. 
We're not bound to the darkness. We're not bound to the evil. We're not bound to be surrounded by our enemies who have free access to us. We are not alone. We are not empty and we are not without a future. Rather, we are people well-fed, well-loved, well-protected and well-cared for, for the purposes of Jesus Christ in this life, for the life to come. And if the church will hold on to the shepherd, I guarantee you, you'll find he's got both hands on you too. He'll pull close that which he loves. The question is, do we trust the shepherd? I invite you this week. We print devotions and we put them out at the exits and the entrances. Grab devotions. Get in the word of God. Spend some time sitting quietly, letting him speak instead of you. Do devotions. Be in the word of God. It's the most transformative thing this world has to offer. The word of God. Scripture. Get quiet. Get still. And drink deeply from that which he has by his spirit authored for us to know. He's not only invested in us, he loves us dearly. And he's a shepherd throughout scripture for a reason. He knows we'll wander. He knows we can be magnificently stupid. And yet he loves us. Isn't that good news? Lord Jesus Christ, we your church today pause before you just to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the good shepherd. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. And fill our lives with a communication that has something to see in between the lines. Speak to us in a way that we could chew on a word from you for years to come. Give courage to us, God, as we are, well, I, as I'm nervous and afraid, as I'm often scared of my own shadow, I pray that you would help us to lead in the confidence of the shepherd, not in the confidence of who we are, but in the confidence of him who authored our life and our days. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you didn't see fit just to bring us into the waters, into the death and the resurrection of Christ, that you didn't see fit to just bring us through the waters, and the trials of this life. But you also called us beside still waters to a place of deep relationship, deep conversation, and a sense of peace and love that comes only from you. So God, thank you for the waters in this life and all the ways that you have used our circumstances to create in us a dependence and a love for the shepherd who is above all things loving and good. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Before we stand and sing, I'd like to invite you to just kind of pay close attention to the words of this song. It's by a band called I Am They. After you listen to it, you'll be like, oh, because you want me to buy it on iTunes. I really do. I don't normally, you know, punch out for a band that I don't super know. I know they're a Christian band, but it's a really good song. It speaks to a lot of what we've talked about in this series, and it calls us to a place of deeper dependence, an understanding of what he's done. He's our rescuer. He's our Lord and he's our savior. I invite you to stand. Sing about it with me now. Aren't you glad he's always been a shepherd? Aren't you glad that with your big drenched head falling into the river, you're not alone? That somebody has a crook to reach in and pull you back and say, remember, it's not the best. Follow me. Aren't you glad that when the waters crash and the storms rage, there is one who is bigger than the storm. There is one who has redeemed everything for his glory. And aren't you glad that he gave you his name, his identity, and said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. My friends, God has been a shepherd all throughout scripture. Throughout the entirety of the scripture narrative, he has been tending to us. And what I love about our faith is that we not only have a good shepherd, but in the reformed tradition, there is the priesthood of all believers. We are being remade by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to become like Christ and to do one thing, to shepherd everyone who is weary, harassed, head soaked and tired towards the good shepherd who can redeem their brokenness and pull them into his family. Your life is meant to tell that story. You're loved beyond what you could imagine. It is so good to be loved like that. And you are. So as you live into his identity, into his calling, into his purposes, may you enjoy the company in the dark places of a good shepherd. May you enjoy 
the pleasant conversation on the good days of a good shepherd. And by all means, may you be the living embodiment of that very shepherd out in this world, welcoming all who are weary and harassed as you go about it. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, you are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.